A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Persons Represented Theseus, Duke of Athens. Read by David Nicholl. Aegeus, Father to Hermia. Read by James Silverstein. Lysander, in love with Hermia. Read by Peter Parshall. Demetrius, in love with Hermia. Read by Alex Lau. Philostrate, master of the revels to Theseus. Read by Ellie Cat. Quince, the carpenter. Read by Libby Gone. Snug, the joiner. Read by Monica M.C. Bottom, the weaver. Read by Alan Mapstone. Flute, the bellows mender. Read by Chuck Williamson. Snout, the tinker. Read by Glorious Job. Starveling, the tailor. Read by Algy Pug. Hippolyta, Queen of the Amazons, betrothed to Theseus. Read by Patty Cunningham. Hermia, daughter to Aegeus, in love with Lysander. Read by Catalina Watt. Helena, in love with Demetrius. Read by Sarah Parshall. Oberon, King of the Fairies. Read by Bob Neufeld. Titania, Queen of the Fairies. Read by Arielle Lipshaw. Puck, or Robin Goodfellow, a fairy. Read by Ellie Cat. Peas Blossom, fairy. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Cobweb, fairy. Read by Annika Vera. Moth, fairy. Read by Rebecca Parshall. Mustard Seed, fairy. By Ethel Bus. Characters in the interlude performed by the clowns. Pyramus. Read by Alan Mapstone. Thisbe. Read by Chuck Williamson. Wall. Read by Glorious Job. Moonshine. Read by Algy Pug. Lion. Read by Monica M.C. End of Persons Represented. Act One of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, Scene One. Athens, a room in the palace of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrate, and attendants. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers by desires, like to a stepdame or a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in nights, four nights will quickly dream away the time, and then the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, fellow straight, stir up the Athenian youth to merriments, awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth, turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Exit, fellow straight. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph. And with revelling. Enter Aegeus, Hermia, Lysander, and Demetrius. Full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, 
Thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with bracelets of thy hair, rings, gauds, conceits, knacks, trifles, nosegays, sweetmeats, messengers of strong prevailment and unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness. And, my gracious duke, be it so she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius, I beg the ancient privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law, immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid. To you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looks but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty, in such a presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case, if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death, or to abjure for ever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires. Know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I, to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold fruitless moon, Thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which, withering on the virgin thorn, grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship, upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I austerity and single life. Relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Scornful Lysander. True, he hath my love, and what is mine my love shall render him, and she is mine, and all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius, and which is more than all these boasts can he, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nadar's daughter, Helena, and won her soul, and she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes and idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self-affairs my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may extenuate, to death or to a vow of single life. 
Come, my Hippolyta. What cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial, and confer with you of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire we follow you. Exeunt Theseus, Hippolyta, Aegeus, Demetrius, and a train. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Belike for want of rain, which I could well, beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. Ah, me, for aught that I could ever read. Could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood. O oh, cross, too high to be enthralled to low. Or else misgraft in respect of years. O oh, spite, too old to be engaged to young. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. O oh, hell, to choose love by another's eye. Or if there was a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness, did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collied night. Then, in a spleen, unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancy's followers. A good persuasion, therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then, steal forth my father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood a league without the town where I did meet thee once with Helena, to do observance to morn of May. There will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow, with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers love, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen, when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke in number more than ever woman spoke in that same place thou hast appointed me to-morrow truly will i meet with thee keep promise love look here comes helena enter helena god speed fair helena whither away call you me fair that fair again unsay demetrius loves your fair o oh, happy fair your eyes are low to stars and your tongue's sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear, when wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching, oh, were favour so, yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody, were the world's mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to you to be translated, Oh, teach me how you look, and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty would that fault were mine. Take comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens as a paradise to me. 
O oh, then, what graces in my love do dwell, That he hath turned the heaven unto hell? Helena, to you our minds we will unfold, Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold, Her silver visage in the watery glass, Decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, A time that lover's flights doth still conceal, Through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds, were wont to lie, emptying our bosom of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes, to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow. Pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food to morrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Exit. Hermia. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius dote on you. Exit Lysander. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all that he do know. As he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes. So I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore winged Cupid painted blind, nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings and eyes figure on heavy haste, and therefore is love said to be a child because in choice he is so oft beguiled as waggish boys and gain themselves forswear so the boy love is perjured everywhere for ere demetrius looked on ermia's eyne that he was only mine and when this hail some heat from hermia felt so he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt i will go tell him of fair hermia's flight then to the wood will he to-morrow night pursue her and for this intelligence if i have thanks it is a dear expense but herein mean i to enrich my pain to have his sight to thither and back again exit helena end of scene one act one scene two the same a room in a cottage enter snug bottom flute snout Quince and Starveling. Is all our company here? You were best to call them generally, man by man, according to the scrip. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on then read the names of the actors and so grow to a point mary our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of pyramus and thisbe a very good piece of work i assure you and a merry now good peter quince call forth your actors by the scroll masters spread yourselves answer as i call you nick bottom the weaver ready name what part i am for and proceed you nick bottom are set down for pyramus what is pyramus a lover or a tyrant a lover that kills himself most gallantly for love that will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest, yet my chief humour is for a tyrant. I could play Ercles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in, to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates and phibus car shall shine from far 
and make and mar the foolish fates. This was lofty. Now name the rest of the players. This is Urkel's vein, a tyrant's vein. My lover is more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Uh, here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. Oh, what is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Oh, nay, faith. Let not me play a woman. I have a beard coming. Oh, that's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisney, Thisney, ah, Pyramus, my lover dear, thy Thisbe dear, and lady dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute, you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus' father, myself, Thisbe's father. Snug the joiner, you the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow at study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will make the duke say, let him roar again. Let him roar again. And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the duchess and the ladies and they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. That, that would, would hang, hang us every, every mother's son. son. I grant you, friends, if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you and twer any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely, gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. I will discharge it in either your straw colour beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrain beard, or your French crown colour beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. But, masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night, and meet me in the palace wood a mile without the town by moonlight. There we will rehearse, for if we meet in the city we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of property such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak we meet. Enough. Hold or cut bowstrings. Exeunt. End of scene two. End of act one. Act two of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act two, scene one. A wood near Athens. Enter a fairy at one door and Puck at another. How now, spirit? Whither wander you? 
over hill, over dale, through a bush, through a briar, over park, over pale, through a flood, through a fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere, and I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coat spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favours, in those freckles live their savours. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and all her elves come here anon. The king doth keep his revels here to-night. Take heed the queen come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fell and wroth, Because that she, as her attendant, Hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling, And jealous Oberon would have the child knight of his train To trace the forests wild. But she perforce withholds the loved boy, Crowns him with flowers, and makes him all her joy. And now they never meet in grove or green, By fountain clear, or spangled starlight sheen, But they do square, that all their elves for fear Creep into acorn cups, and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape and making quite, Or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite Called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Skim milk and sometimes labour in the quern, And bootless makes the breathless housewife churn, And sometime make the drink to bear no balm, Mislead night wanderers laughing at their harm. Those that hobgoblin call you, and sweet puck, You do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speaks aright, I am that merry wanderer of the night, I jest to Oberon and make him smile, When I a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, Neighing in likeness of a filly foal, And sometime lurk I in a gossip's bowl, In very likeness of a roasted crab, And, when she drinks, against her lips I bob, And on her withered dewlap pour the ale, The wisest aunt telling the saddest tale, Sometime for three-foot stool mistaketh me, Then slip I from her bum, down topples she, And Taylor cries, and falls into a cough, And then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, And wax it in their mirth, and knees, and swear, A merrier hour was never wasted there, But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress, would that he were gone! Enter Oberon at one door with his train, and Titania at another with hers. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What, jealous Oberon, fairies skip hence, I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry, rash wanton, am not I thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, And in the shape of Corin sat all day, Playing on pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Phyllida. Why art thou here, come from that farthest deep of India, But that, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, Your buskined mistress and your warrior love, To Theseus must be wedded, And you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus, for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? It's not thou lead him through the glimmering night from Perigenia, whom he ravished, and make him with fair eagle break his faith with Ariadne and Antiope. These are the forgeries of jealousy. And never since the middle summer's spring met we on hill in dale, forest or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or on the beached margin of the sea to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind, but with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds, 
piping to us in vain as in revenge, have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which, falling in the land, hath every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox hath therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the ploughman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. The fold stands empty in the drowned field, and crows are fatted with the murrian flock. The nine men's morris is filled up with mud, and the quaint mazes in the wanton green, for lack of tread, are undistinguishable. The human mortals want their winter here. No night is now with him or carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this distemperature we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old Hyam's thin and icy crown an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter change their wonted liveries, and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension, we are their parents and original. Do you amend it, then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. His mother was a votress of my order, and— in the spiced Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side, and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarked traders on the flood, when we have laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big-bellied with the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait following, her womb then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die. And for her sake do I rear up her boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies, away. We shall chide down right if I longer stay. Exit Titania with her train. Well. Go thy way, thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song, and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal thrown it by the west and loosed his love-shaft smartly from his bow, as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon, and the imperial votaress passed on in maiden meditation, fancy-free. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk-white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it, on sleeping eyelids laid, will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, 
and be thou here again ere the leviathan can swim a league i'll put a girdle round about the earth in forty minutes exit huck having once this juice i'll watch titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes the next thing then she waking looks upon be it on lion bear or wolf or bull on meddling monkey or on busy ape she shall pursue it with the soul of love and ere i take this charm from off her sight as i can take it with another herb i'll make her render up her page to me but who comes here i am invisible and i will overhear their conference Enter Demetrius, Helena following him. I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen into this wood, and here am I, and woed within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence get thee gone, and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant, but yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that, i love you the more i am your spaniel and demetrius the more you beat me i will fawn on you use me but as your spaniel spurn me strike me neglect me lose me only give me leave unworthy as i am to follow you what worser place can i beg in your love and yet a place of high respect with me than to be use it as you use your dog Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much, to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night, and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege for that. It is not night when I do see your face. Therefore, I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company. For you in my respect are all the world. Then how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee and hide me in the brakes and leave thee to the mercy of wild beasts the wildest hath not such a heart as you run when you will the story will be changed apollo flies and daphne holds the chase the dove pursues the griffin the mild hind makes speed to catch the tiger bootless speed when cowardice pursues and valor flies i will not stay thy questions let me go or if thou follow me, do not believe, for I shall do thee mischief in the wood. I, in the temple, in the town, the field, you do me mischief. Fie, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed, and we're not made to woo. I'll follow thee, and make a heaven of hell, to die upon the hand I love so well. Exeunt Demetrius and Helena. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Re enter Huck. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Ay, there it is. I pray thee, give it me. I know a bank where on the wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows, 
quite over-canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk-roses, and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this I'll streak her eyes, and make her full of hateful fantasies. Take thou some of it, and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect it with some care, that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look thou, Meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. Exeunt. End of scene one. Act two, scene two. Another part of the wood. Enter Titania with her train. Come now, a roundel and a fairy song. Then for the third part of a minute hence, some to kill cankers in the musk-rose buds, some war with riri mice for their leathern wings to make my small elves coats, and some keep back the clamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders at our quaint spirits. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices, and let me rest. Song One You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Newts and blind worms do no wrong. Come not near our fairy queen. Philomel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby. La 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 lullaby. La 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 lullaby. Never harm nor spell nor charm. Come our lovely lady nigh. So good night with lullaby. Song two. Weaving spiders come not here, hence you long-legged spinners' heads. Beetles black approach not near, worm nor snail. Do no offence. Philomel with melody. Hence away, now all is well. One aloof, stand sentinel. Exeunt fairies, Titania sleeps. Enter Oberon. What thou seest when thou dost wake? Squeezes the flower on Titania's eyelids. Do it for thy true love take, love and languish for his sake. Be it ounce or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair in thy eye that shall appear, when thou wakest it is thy dear wake when some vile thing is near exit enter lysander and hermia fair love you faint with wandering in the wood and to speak troth i have forgot our way will rest us hermia if you think it good and tarry for the comfort of the day be it so lysander find you out to bed for i upon this bank will rest my head one turf shall serve as pillow for us both one heart one bed two bosoms and one trough nay good lysander for my sake my dear lie farther off yet do not lie so near oh take the sense sweet of my innocence love takes the meaning in love's conference i mean that my heart unto yours is knit so that but one heart we can make of it Two bosoms interchained with an oath. So then two bosoms in a single troth. Then by your side no bedroom me deny. For lying so, Hermia, I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride. If Hermia meant to say Lysander lied, that gentle friend for love and courtesy lie further off in human modesty such separation as may well be said becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid so far be distant and good night sweet friend thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet life end amen amen 
to that fair prayer, say I, and then end life when I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep, give thee all his rest. With half that wish the wisher's eyes be pressed. They sleep. Enter Puck. Through the forest I have gone, but Athenian found I none on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force and stirring love. Night and silence. Who is here? Weeds of Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despised the Athenian maid, and here the maiden sleeping sound on the dank and dirty ground. Pretty soul, she durst not lie near this lack, love, this kill courtesy. Churl, upon thy eyes I throw all the power this charm doth owe. When thou wakest, let love forbid sleep his seat on thy eyelid. So awake when I am gone, for I must now to Oberon. Exit. Enter Demetrius and Helena running. Stay, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee, hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou, darkling, leave me? Do not so. Stay on thy peril. I alone will go. Exit Demetrius. Oh, I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright, not with salt tears? If so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore no marvel, though Demetrius, do as a monster fly my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's sphery eyne? But who is here, Lysander, on the ground, dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. Lysander waking. And run through fire, I will, for thy sweet sake, transparent Helena. Nature show art, that through thy bosom make me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word! Is that vile name to perish on my sword? Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though he love your Hermia? Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. Content with Hermia? No. I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. Not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season. So I being young, till now ripe, not to reason, and touching now the point of human skill, Reason becomes the marshal to my will, and leads me to your eyes, where I overlook love's stories, written in love's richest book. Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve this scorn? Is't not enough, is't not enough, young man, that I did never, nor never can, deserve a sweet look from Demetrius's eye, but you must float my insufficiency? Good trout you do me wrong, good sooth you do, in such a disdainful manner me to woo. But fare you well, perforce I must confess, I thought you a lord of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused, should of another therefore be abused. Exit. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayest thou come Lysander near. For, as a surfeit of the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings, or, as the heresies that men do leave, are hated most of those they did deceive, so thou, my surfeit and my heresy, of all be hated, but the most of me, and all my powers, address your love and might, to honor Helen, and to be her knight. Exit. Hermia, starting. Help me, Lysander, help me! 
do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast i me for pity what a dream was here lysander look how i do quake with fear methought a serpent at my heart away and you sat smiling at his cruel prey lysander what removed lysander lord what out of hearing gone no sound no word alack where are you speak and if you hear speak of all loves i swoon almost with fear no then i will perceive you are not nigh either death or you are fined immediately exit end of scene two end of act two Act Three of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One The Wood. The Queen of Fairies lying asleep. Enter Quince, Snug, Bottom, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Are we all met? Pat, pat, and here's a marvellous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage, this hawthorn break our tiring house, and we will do it in action, as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please first pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself which the ladies cannot abide how answer you that by a lichen a parlous fear i believe we must leave the killing out when all is done not a whit i have a device to make all well write me a prologue and let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords and that pyramus is not killed indeed and for the more better assurance tell them that i pyramus am not pyramus but bottom the weaver this will put them out of fear well we will have such a prologue and it shall be written in eight and six no make it two more let it be written in eight and eight will not the ladies be afeard of the lion i fear it i promise you masters you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in god shield us a lion among ladies is a most dreadful thing for there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living and we ought to look to it therefore another prologue must tell he is not a lion nay you must name his name and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck and he himself must speak through saying thus or to the same defect ladies or fair ladies i would wish you or i would request you or i would entreat you not to fear not to tremble my life for yours if you think i come hither as a lion it were pity of my life no i am no such thing i am a man as other men are and there indeed let him name his name and tell them plainly he is snug the joiner well it shall be so but there is two hard things and that is to bring the moonlight into a chamber for you know pyramus and thisbe meet by moonlight doth the moon shine that night we play our play a calendar a calendar look in the almanac find out moonshine find out moonshine yes 
It doth shine that night. Why, then may you leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play open, and the moon may shine in at the casement. Ay, or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern, and say he comes to disfigure, or to present the person, of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus and Thisbe, says the story, did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come, sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so every one according to his cue. Enter Puck behind. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What, a play toward? I'll be an auditor, and actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speak, Pyramus, and Thisbe stand forth. Thisbe, the flowers of odious savours sweet. Odors, odors. Odors, savours sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest Thisbe dear. But hark, a voice. Stay thou but here a while and by and by i will to thee appear exit a stranger pyramus than e'er played here aside exit oh must i speak now ay marry must you for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again most radiant pyramus <laughs> most lily-white of hue of colour like the red rose of triumphant raya most risky juvenile and eke most lovely jew as true as truest horse that would never tire i'll meet thee pyramus at ninny's tomb ninus tomb man why, you must not speak that yet, that you answer to Pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter, your cue is past. It is never tire. Oh, as true, as truest horse, that would never tire. Re-enter Puck, and bottom with an ass's head. If I were fair, Thisbe, I were only thine. Oh, monstrous! Oh, strange! We are haunted! Pray, masters, fly! Fly, masters! Help! Exeunt clowns. I'll follow you. I'll lead you about around. Through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound. A hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire and neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn like horse hound hog bear fire at every turn exit why do they run away this is a knavery of them to make me afeard re-enter snout o bottom thou art changed what do i see on thee what do you see you see an asset of your own, do you? Re-enter Quince. Bless thee, Bottom, bless thee, thou art translated. Exit. I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me if they could. But I will not stir from this place, do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing, that they shall hear I am not afraid. Sings 
The usual cock so black of hue with orange tawny bill, the throttle with his note so true, the wren with little quill. Titania, waking. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? Bottom sings. The finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo grey, whose note full many a man doth mark, and dares not answer nay. For indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry cuckoo never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamoured of thy note, so is mine eye enthralled to thy shape, and thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that, and yet, to say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity, as some honest neighbours will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so, neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve my own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee, and they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep, and sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. Enter four fairies. Ready. And I. And I. Where shall we go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricocks and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees and for night tapers crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glow-worm's eyes to have my love to bed and to arise and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes nod to him elves and do him courtesies hail mortal hail 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 I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. I shall desire you of more acquaintance, good master Cobweb. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest gentleman. Peas Blossom. I pray you. Commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Pease Cod, your father. Good Master Pease Blossom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance, too. Your name, I beseech you, sir. Mustard Seed. Good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly giant like ox beef hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you, your kindred hath made my eyes water ere now. I desire you of more acquaintance, good master mustard seed. Come, wait upon him, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye. And when she weeps, weeps every little flower, lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my love's tongue, bring him silently. Exeunt. End of scene one. Act three, scene two. Another part of the wood. 
Enter Oberon. I wonder if Titania be awake. Then what it was that next came in her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. Enter Puck. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit? What night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love. Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls, were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus' nuptial day. The shallowest thickskin of that barren sort, who Pyramus presented in their sport, forsook his scene and entered in a break when I did him at this advantage take, an ass's nowl I fixed on his head. Anon his thisbe must be answered, and forth my mimic comes, when they him spy as wild geese that the creeping fowler eye, or russet pated chuffs, many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky, so at his sight away his fellows fly, and at our stamp here, o'er and o'er one falls, he murder cries and help from Athens calls, their sense thus weak, lost with their fears thus strong, made senseless things begin to do them wrong. For briars and thorns at their apparel snatch, some sleeves, some hats, from yielders all things catch. I led them on this distracted fear, and left sweet Pyramus translated there, when in that moment, so it came to pass, Titania waked, and straightway loved an ass. This falls out better than I could devise, but hast thou yet latched the Athenian's eyes with the love juice, as I did bid thee do? I took him sleeping, that is finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he waked, a force she must be eyed. Enter Demetrius and Hermia. Stand close, this is the same Athenian. This is the woman, but not this the man. Oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being o'er shoes in blood, plunge in the deep, and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon this whole earth may be bored, and that the moon may through the centre's creeps and so displease her brother's noontime with the Antipodes. It cannot be but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look, so dead, so grim. So should the murdered look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear, as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, oh, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I had rather give his carcass to my hounds. Out, dog! Out, cur! Thou drivest me past the bounds of maiden patience. Hast thou slain him, then? Henceforth be never numbered among men. Oh, once tell true, tell true, even for my sake. Dost thou have looked upon him being awake, and hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch! Could not a worm and adder do so much? An adder did it, for with doubler tongue than thine thou serpent never adder stung. You spend your passion on a misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood. Nor is he dead, for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get therefore? A privilege never to see me more. And from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more whether he be dead or no. Exit. There is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, for a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, For debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, Which now in some slight measure it will pay, If for his tender here I make some stay. Demetrius lies down. What hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and lay the love-juice on some true love's sight. 
of thy misprision must perforce ensue some true love turned and not a false turned true then fate o'er rules that one man holding troth a million fail confounding oath on oath about the wood go swifter than the wind and helena of athens look thou find all of fancy sick she is and pale of cheer with sighs of love that costs the fresh blood dear by some illusion see thou bring her here i'll charm his eyes against she do appear i go i go look how i go swifter than an arrow from the tartar's bow Exit flower of this purple dye hit with cupid's archery sink in apple of his eye when his love he doth espy let her shine as gloriously as the venus of the sky when thou wak'st if she be by beg of her for remedy re-enter puck captain of our fairy band helena is here at hand and the youth mistook by me pleading for a lover's fee shall we their fond pageant see lord what fools these mortals be stand aside the noise they make will cause demetrius to awake then will two at once woo one that must needs be sport alone and those things do best please me that befall preposterously enter lysander and helena why should you think i should woo in scorn scorn and derision never come in tears look when i vow i weep and vows so born and their nativity all truth appears how can these things in me seem scorn to you bearing the badge of faith to prove them true you do advance your cunning more and more when truth kills truth o oh devilish holy fray these vows are hermia's will you give her or weigh oath with oath and you will nothing weigh your vows to her and me put into scales will even weigh and both as light as tails i had no judgment when to her i swore nor none in my mind now you give her or demetrius loves her and he loves not you demetrius awaking oh helena goddess nymph perfect divine to what my love shall i compare thine eyne crystal is muddy oh how ripens show thy lips those kissing cherries tempting grow that pure congealed white high taurus snow fan with the eastern wind turns to a crow when thou holdst up thy hand oh let me kiss this princess of pure white this seal of bliss oh spite oh hell i see you are all bent to set against me for your merriment if you were civil and knew courtesy you would not do me thus much injury can you not hate me as i know you do but you must join in souls to mock me too if you were men as men you are in show you would not use a gentle lady so to vow and swear and super praise my parts when i am sure you both hate me with your hearts you both are rivals and love hermia and now both rivals to mock helena a trim exploit a manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision none of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience all to make you sport you are unkind demetrius be not so for you love hermia this you know i know and here with all good will with all my heart in hermia's love i yield you up my part and yours of helena to bequeath whom i do love and will do till my death never did mockers waste more idle breath lysander keep thy hermia i will none if e'er i loved her all that love is gone my heart to her but as guest wise sojourned and now to helen is it home returned there to remain helena it is not so disparage not the faith thou dost not know lest to thy peril thou abide it dear 
Look where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. Enter Hermia. Dark night, that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not by mine eye, Lysander, found, mine ear, I thank it, brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly dost thou leave me so? Why should he stay whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love, that would not let him bide. Fair Helena, who more in guilds than night, than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light? Why seekest thou me? Could not this make thee know? The hate I bear thee made me love thee so. You speak not as you think, it cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared? The sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent. When we have child the hasty-footed time for parting us, oh, is all forgot? All school days friendship, childhood innocence. We, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate, so we grew together like to a double cherry seeming parted but yet a union in partition two lovely berries moulded on one stem so with two seeming bodies but one heart two of the first like coats in heraldry do but to one and crowned with one crest and will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend it is not friendly, tis not maidenly, our sex as well as I may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face? And made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot, to call me goddess, nymph, divine, and rare, precious, celestial? Wherefore speaks he this, to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul? And tender me, forsooth, affection, but by your setting on, by your consent? What, though I be not so in grace as you? so hung upon with love so fortunate but miserable most to love unloved this you should pity rather than despise i understand not what you mean by this i do persever counterfeit sad looks make mows upon me when i turn my back wink at each other hold the sweet jest up this sport while carried shall be chronicled if you have any pity grace or manners you would not make me such an argument, but fare ye well, tis partly my own fault, which death or absence soon shall remedy. Stay, gentle Helena, hear my excuse, my love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent. Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel me no more than she entreat. Thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee, but my life I do. I swear that by which I will lose for thee, to prove him false, that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou sayest so, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come. Lysander, where to tends all this? Away, you Ethiop! No, no, he'll seem to break loose, take on as you would follow, but yet come not. You are a tame man. Go! Hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing. Let loose. 
or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Why are you grown so rude? What change is this, sweet love? Thy love. Out, tawny tartar, out, out, loathed medicine, hatred potion, hence. Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll not trust your word. What? Should I hurt her? Strike her? Kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What? Can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me? Wherefore? Oh me! What news, my love? Am I not Hermia? Are you not Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why then you left me? Oh, the gods forbid. In earnest, shall I say? I, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore, out of hope, out of question, doubt, be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, me! You juggler! You canker blossom! You thief of love! What? Have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, I faith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What? Will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fee! Fee! You counterfeit! You puppet! You! Puppet? Why so? Ay, that way goes again. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height forsooth, she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem, because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. I have no gift at all in shrewishness. I am a right maid for my cowardice. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think, because she is something lower than myself, that I can match her. Lower? Hark again. Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. Did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you? Save that in love unto Demetrius. I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you, for love I followed him. But he hath chid me hence, and threatened me too, to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quiet go, to act will I bear my folly back, and follow you no farther. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Why, get you gone. Who is it that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Oh, when she's angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Little again, nothing but low and little. Why, will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Get you gone, you dwarf, you minimus, you hindering knotgrass maid, you bead, you acorn. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone, speak not of Helena, take not her part, for, if thou dost intend, never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not, now follow, if thou darst to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. Follow, nay, I'll go with thee, cheek by jowl. Exeunt Lysander and Demetrius you mistress all this coil is long of you nay go not back i will not trust you i nor longer stay in your cursed company your hands than mine are quicker for a fray my legs are longer though to run away exit i am amazed and know not what to say exit 
pursuing Helena. This is thy negligence. Still thou mistakest, or else commits thy knaveries willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did not you tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far blameless proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. And so far am I glad it so did sort as this their jangling I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hi, therefore, Robin, overcast the night. The starry welkin cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Asheron, and lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way. Like to Lysander, sometime frame thy tongue, then stir Demetrius up with bitter wrong, and sometime rail thou like Demetrius and from each other look thou lead them thus till o'er their brows death counterfeiting sleep with leaden legs and batty wings doth creep then crush this herb into lysander's eye whose liquor hath this virtuous property to take from thence all error with his might and make his eyeballs roll with wonted sight when they next wake all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend with league, whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I in this affair do thee employ, I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charmed eye release from monsters' view, and all things shall be peace. My fairy lord, this must be done with haste, for night's swift dragons cut the clouds full fast, and yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts, wandering here and there, troop home to churchyards, damned spirits all, that in crossways and floods have burial, already to their wormy beds are gone, for fear lest day should look their shames upon they willfully exile themselves from light, and must for aye consort with black-browed night. But we are spirits of another sort. I with the morning's love have oft made sport. And, like a forester, the groves may tread even till the eastern gate, all fiery red, opening on Neptune with fair blessed beams, turns into yellow gold his salt-green streams. But, notwithstanding, haste, make no delay. We may effect this business yet ere day. Exit Oberon. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town. Goblin, lead them up and down. Here comes one. Enter Lysander. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, drawn and ready, where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me, then, to plainer ground. Exit Lysander as following the voice. Enter Demetrius. Lysander, speak again. Thou runaway, thou coward, art thou fled? Speak, in some bush. Where dost thou hide thy head? Thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars, telling the bushes that thou lookst for wars and wilt not come? Come, recreant, come thou child. I'll whip thee with a rod. He is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice. We'll try no manhood here. Exeunt. Re-enter Lysander. He goes before me and still dares me on. When I come, he calls. Then he is gone. The villain is much lighter heeled than I. I followed fast, but faster he did fly. That fallen am I in dark, uneven way. And here will rest me. Come, thou gentle day. Lysander lies down. For if but once thou show me the gray light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this fight. Sleeps. Re-enter Puck and Demetrius. Ho, 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 ho. Coward, why comest thou not? Abide me, if thou darest, for well I wot, thou runst before me, shifting every place and darest not stand, nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? Come hither, I am here. 
Nay, then, thou mockst me. Thou shalt buy this dear, if ever I thy face by daylight see. Now, go thy way, faintness constraineth me, to measure out my length on this cold bed. By day's approach, look to be visited. Demetrius lies down and sleeps. Enter Helena. O weary night, O long and tedious night, abate thy hours, shine comforts from the east, that I may go back to Athens by daylight, from these that my poor company detest, and sleep that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eye, steal me a while from mine own company. Helena sleeps. Yet but three, come one more, two of both kinds make up four. Here she comes, cursed and sad. Cupid is a knavish lad, thus to make poor females mad. Enter Hermia. Never so weary, never so in woe, bedabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Heaven shield Lysander if they mean a fray. Hermia lies down. On the ground, sleep sound, I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover remedy. Squeezing the juice on Lysander's eye. When thou wakest, thou takest true delight in the sight of thy former lady's eye, and the country proverb known that every man should take his own, in your waking shall be sown. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill, the man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Exit Puck. Demetrius, Helena, etc. Sleep. End of Scene 2. End of Act 3. Act 4 of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Act 4, Scene 1. The Wood. Enter Titania and Bottom. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth, mustard seed, and other fairies attending. Oberon behind, unseen. Come, sit thee down upon this flowery bed, while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk-roses in thy sleek smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. Where's Peas Blossom? Ready. Scratch my head, Peas Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Monsieur Cobweb. Good Monsieur. Get you your weapon in your hand and kill me a red-hipped humble-bee on the top of a thistle. And, good monsieur, bring me the honey-bag. Do not fret yourself too much in the action, monsieur. And, good monsieur, have a care the honey-bag break not. I would be loath to have you overflown with a honey-bag, signor. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready. Give me your neff, Monsieur Mustard Seed. Pray you, leave your curtsy, good Monsieur. What's your will? Nothing, good Monsieur, but to help Cavallero Cobweb to scratch. I must to the barbers, Monsieur, for methinks I am marvellous hairy about the face. And I am such a tender ass, if my hair do but tickle me, I must scratch. What, wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let us have the tongs and the bones. Or say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. Truly, a peck of provender, I could munch your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay, hath no fellow. 
I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard and fetch thee new nuts. I had rather have a handful or two of dried peas. But I pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. So doth the woodbine the sweet honeysuckle gently entwist, the female ivy so enrings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee! How I dote on thee! They sleep. Oberon advances. Enter Puck. Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favours for this hateful fool, I did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples then had rounded with coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers, and that same dew which sometime on the buds was wont to swell like round and orient pearls, stood now within the pretty floweret's eyes, like tears that did their own disgrace bewail. When I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. And now I have the boy, I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And, gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he, awaking when the other do, may all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's accidents but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first I will release the fairy queen. Be as thou wast wont to be. Touching her eyes with an herb. See thou as thou wast wont to see. Diane's bud or Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon! What visions have I seen? Methought I was enamoured of an ass. There lies your love. How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Silence, O Isle. Robin, take off this head. Titania, music call, and strike more dead than common sleep of all these five the sense. Music, ho, music such as charmeth sleep. Now when thou wakest with thine own fool's eyes peep. Sound music. Still music. Come, my queen, take hands with me, and rock the ground whereon these sleepers be. Now thou and I are new in amity and will to-morrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke Theseus's house triumphantly, and bless it to all fair prosperity. There shall the pairs of faithful lovers be wedded, with Theseus all in jollity. Fairy king, attend and mark. I do hear the morning lark. Then, my queen, in silence sad, trip we after night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. Come, my lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night, that I sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground. Exeunt. Horns sound within. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Aegeus, and Train. Go, one of you, find out the forester. For now our observation is performed, and since we have the voward of the day, my love shall hear the music of my hounds. Uncouple in the western valley, go, dispatch, I say, and find the forester. Exit an attendant. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top, and mark the musical confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. 
I was with Hercules and Cadmus once, when in a wood of Crete they bade the bear with hounds of Sparta. Never did I hear such gallant chiding, for, besides the groves, the skies, the fountains, every region near seemed all one mutual cry. I never heard so musical a discord, such sweet thunder. My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind, so flewed, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. Crook-kneed and dew-lapped like Thessalian bulls, slow in pursuit but matched in mouth like bells, each under each. A cry more tunable was never hallowed to nor cheered with horn in Crete, in Sparta, nor in Thessaly. Judge when you hear. But soft, what nymphs are these? My lord, this is my daughter here asleep, and this Lysander. This Demetrius is, this Helena, old Nedir's Helena. I wonder of their being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and, hearing our intent, came here in grace of our solemnity. But, speak, Aegeus, is this not the day that Hermia should give answer of her choice? It is, my lord. Go, bid the huntsmen wake them with their horns. Horns and shout within. Demetrius, Lysander, Hermia, and Helena awake and start up. Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine is past. Begin these woodbirds but to couple now? Pardon, my lord. He and the rest kneel to Theseus. I pray you all stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world, that hatred is so far from jealousy to sleep by hate, and fear no enmity? My lord, I shall reply amazedly, half sleep, half waking, but as yet I swear I cannot truly say how I came here, but as I think, for truly would I speak, and now I do bethink me. So it is. I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens, where we might be without the peril of the Athenian law. Enough, enough, my lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away, they would, Demetrius, thereby to have defeated you and me, you of your wife and me of my consent of my consent that she should be your wife my lord fair helen told me of their stealth of this their purpose hither to this wood and i in fury hither followed them fair helena in fancy following me but my good lord i wot not by what power but by some power it is my love to hermia melted as the snow seems to me now as the remembrance of an idle god which in my childhood I did dote upon, and all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye, is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed, ere I saw Hermia. But like in sickness did I loathe this food, but as in health, come to my natural taste, now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. Fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse we more will hear anon. Aegeus, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by, with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. And, for the morning now is something worn, our purposed hunting shall be set aside. Away with us, to Athens, three and three. We'll hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. Exeunt Theseus. Hippolyta, Aegeus, and Train. These things seem small and undistinguishable, like far-off mountains turned into clouds. Methinks I see these things with parted eye, when everything seems double. So, methinks, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel, mine own and not mine own. It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream, do not you think the duke was here, and bid us follow him? Yea, and my father. And Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow to the temple. Why, then, we are awake. Let's follow him. 
and by the way, let us recount our dreams. Exeunt. As they go out, Bottom awakes. <sighs> when my cue comes, call me, and I will answer. My next is Most Fair Pyramus. Hey ho, Peter Quince, Flute the Bellows Mender, Snout the Tinker, Starbling, God's my life, Stolen hence and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream methought i was there is no man can tell what methought i was and methought i had but man is but a patch fool if he will offer to say what methought i had the eye of man hath not heard the ear of man hath not seen man's hand is not able to taste his tongue to conceive nor his heart to report what my dream was i will get peter quince to write a ballad of this dream it shall be called bottom's dream because it hath no bottom and i will sing it in the latter end of a play before the duke for adventure to make it the more gracious i shall sing it at her death. Exit. End of scene one. Act four, scene two. Athens, a room in Quince's house. Enter Quince, flute, snout, and starveling. Have you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt, he is transported. If he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forward, doth it? It is not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus but he. No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Athens. Yea, and the best person, too, and he is the very paramour for a sweet voice. You must say, Paragon, a paramour is, God bless us, a thing of naught. Enter Snug. Masters, the Duke is coming from the temple, and there is two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we had all been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom. Thus hath he lost sixpence a day during his life. He could not have scraped sixpence a day. And the Duke had not given him sixpence a day for playing Pyramus. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Sixpence a day in Pyramus. Or nothing. Enter Bottom. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Bottom, oh, most courageous day, oh, most happy hour. Masters, I am to discourse wonders. But ask me not what, for if I tell you, I am not true Athenian. I will tell you everything right as it fell out. Let us hear, sweet Bottom. Not a word of me. All that I will tell you is that the Duke hath dined. Get your apparel together. Good strings to your beards. New ribbons to your pumps. Meet presently at the palace. Every man look over his part, for the short and the long is. Our play is preferred. In any case, let Thisbe have clean linen. And let not him that plays the lion pare his nails, for they shall hang out of the lion's claws. 
and most of dear actors eat no onions nor garlic for we are to utter sweet breath and i do not doubt but to hear them say it is a sweet comedy no more words away go away exeunt end of scene two end of act four Act Five of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Act Five, Scene One, Athens, an apartment in the palace of Theseus. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, Philostrate, lords and attendants. "'Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of." "'More strange than true. I never may believe these antique fables and all these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact, one sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That is the madman. The lover, all as frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes, and gives to airy nothing a local habitation, and a name. Such tricks hath strong imagination that, if it would but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed a bear. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancy's images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. Enter Lysander, Demetrius, Hermia, and Helena. Here come the lovers full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love accompany your hearts. More than to us, wait in your royal walks, your board, your bed. Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between our after-supper and bedtime? Where is our usual manager of mirth? What revels are in hand? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Call fellow straight. Here, mighty Theseus. Say, what abridgment have you for this evening? What mask, what music? How shall we beguile the lazy time if not with some delight? There is a brief how many sports are ripe, make choice of which your highness will see first. Giving a paper. Theseus reads. The battle with the centaurs, to be sung by an Athenian eunuch to the harp? Will none of that. That have I told my love in glory of my kinsman Hercules. The riot of the tipsy bacchanals tearing the Thracian singer in their rage. That is an old device, and it was played when I from Thebes came last a conqueror. The thrice three muses mourning for the death of learning, late deceased in beggary. That is some satire keen and critical, not sorting with a nuptial ceremony. A tedious brief scene of young Pyramus and his love Thisbe, very tragical mirth. Merry and tragical? Tedious and brief? That is hot ice, and wondrous strange snow. How shall we find the concord of this discord? A play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief as I have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, it is too long, which makes it tedious, for in all the play there is not one word apt, 
one player fitted, and tragical, my noble lord, it is, for Pyramus therein doth kill himself, which when I saw rehearsed, I must confess, made mine eyes water, but more merry tears the passion of loud laughter never shed. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over, and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain, to do you service. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, ladies. Exit Philostrate I love not to see wretchedness o'ercharged, and duty in his service perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in this kind. The kinder we to give them thanks for nothing. Our sport shall be to take what they mistake, and what poor duty cannot do, noble respect takes it in might, not merit. Where I have come, great clerks have purposed to greet me with premeditated welcomes. When I have seen them shiver and look pale, make periods in the midst of sentences, throttle their practised accent in their fears, and, in conclusion, dumbly have broke off, not paying me a welcome. Trust me, sweet, out of this silence yet I picked a welcome, and in the modesty of fearful duty I read as much as from the rattling tongue of saucy and audacious eloquence. Love, therefore, and tongue-tied simplicity, in least speak most to my capacity. Enter Philostrate. So please your grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach. Flourish of trumpets. Enter prologue. If we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will to show our simple skill. That is the true beginning of our end. Consider then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to content you. Our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here. That you should here repent you. The actors are at hand, and by their show you shall know all that you are like to know. This fellow doth not stand upon points. He hath rid his prologue like a rough coal. He knows not to stop. A good moral, my lord. It is not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, he hath played on this prologue like a child on a recorder. A sound, but not in government. His speech was like a tangled chain, nothing impaired, but all disordered. Who is next? Enter Pyramus and Thisbe, Wall, Moonshine, and Lion, as in dumb show. Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady, Thisbe, is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall, that vile wall which did these lovers sunder, and through wall's chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper, at the which let no man wonder. This man with lanthorn, dog, and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine, for if you will know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Ninus' tomb, there, there to woo. This grisly beast, which by name lion hight, thy trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright, and as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion, vile with bloody mouth, did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Thisbe's mantle slain, whereat, with blade, with bloody, blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling, bloody breast, and Thisbe, tarrying in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moonshine, wall, and lovers twain at large discourse while here they do remain. Exeunt Prologue, Thisbe, Lion, and Moonshine. 
I wonder if the lion be to speak. No wonder, my lord, one lion may, when many asses do. In this same interlude it doth befall, that I, once now by name, present a wall, and such a wall as I would have you think, that had in it a crannied hole or chink, through which the lovers, Pyramus and Thisbe, did whisper often very secretly, This loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show, that I am that same wall, the truth is so, and this the cranny is, right and sinister, through which the fearful lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? It is the wittiest partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. Pyramus draws near the wall. Silence. Enter Pyramus. O oh, grim-looked knight! O oh, knight with hue so black! O oh, knight, which ever art when day is not? O oh, knight, O oh, knight! Alack, alack, alack! I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgot. And thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet, O oh, lovely wall, that standeth between her father's ground and mine. Thou wall, O oh wall, O oh sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink to blink through with mine eyne. Wall holds up his fingers. Thanks, courteous wall. Jove shield thee well for this. But what see I? No Thisbe do I see. O oh, wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss, Cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me. The wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. No, in truth, sir, he should not. Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now, and I am to spy her through the wall. You shall see it will fall pat as I told you. Yonder she comes. Enter Thisbe. Full often hast thou heard my moans For parting my fair Pyramus and me My cherry lips have oft kissed thy stones Thy stones with lime and hair knit up in fee I see a voice, now will I to the chink To spy and I can hear my Thisbe's face Thisbe I love, thou art my love, I think. Think what thou wilt, I am thy lover's grace, And like Limander am I trusty still. And I, like Helen, though the fates me kill. Not Shavalus to Procus was so true. As Shavalus to Procus, I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole in this vile wall. Well, kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. Wilt thou at Ninny's tomb meet me straightway? Tide, life, thy death, I come without delay. Thus have I, wall, my part discharged so, and being done, Thus wall away doth go. Exeunt Wall, Pyramus, and Thisbe. Now is the mural down between the two neighbours. No remedy, my lord, when walls are so wilful to hear without warning. This is the silliest stuff that ever I heard. The best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination, then and not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts in, a moon and a lion. Enter lion and moonshine. You, ladies, you, whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monster's mouse that creeps on floor, may now, perchance, both quake and tremble here. When lion wrath in wildest rage doth roar. 
and know that I, once not the joiner, am a lion fell, nor else no lion's dam. For if I should as lion come and strive into this place, trap pity on my life. A very gentle beast, and of a good conscience. The very best at a beast, my lord, that e'er I saw. This lion is a very fox for his valour. True, and a goose for his discretion. Not so, my lord, for his valour cannot carry his discretion, and the fox carries the goose. His discretion, I am sure, cannot carry his valour, for the goose carries not the fox. It is well. Leave it to his discretion, and let us listen to the moon. This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. He should have worn the horns on his head. He is no crescent, and his horns are invisible within the circumference. This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. Myself the man in the moon do seem to be. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be put into the lantern. How else is it the man in the moon? He dares not come there for a candle. For you see, it is already in snuff. I am a weary of this moon. Would he would change. It appears by his small light of discretion that he is in the wane. But yet in courtesy, in all reason, we must stay the time. Proceed, moon. All I have to say is to tell you that the lanthorn is the moon, I the man in the moon, this thornbush, my thornbush, and this dog, my dog. Why, all these should be in the lanthorn, for all these are in the moon. But silence, here comes Fisby. Enter Fisby. This is old Minnie's tomb. Where is my love? The lion roars. Thisby runs off. Well roared, lion. Well run, Thisby. Well shone, moon. Truly the moon shines with a good grace. The lion tears Thisby's mantle and exit. Well moused, lion. And then came Pyramus. And then the lion vanishes. To Pyramus. Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by thy gracious, golden, glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest Thisbe sight. But stay, who oh spite? But mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here? Eyes, do you see? How can it be? O oh, dainty duck, O oh, dear! Thy mantle good, what, stained with blood? Approach, ye furies fell! O oh, fates, come, come, cut thread and thrum! Quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion, and the death of a near friend, would go near to make a man look sad. Beshrew my heart, but I pity the man. Oh, wherefore, nature, didst thou lions frame, since lion vile hath here deflowered my dear? Which is, no, no, which was the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer? Come, tears confound, outsword and wound the pap of Pyramus. I, that left pap, where heart doth hop. Thus die I, thus, thus, thus. Now am I dead. Now. Am I fled? My soul is in the sky. Tongue, lose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. Now die, 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 die. Dies. Exit moonshine. No die, 
but an ace for him, for he is but one. Less than an ace, man, for he is dead, he is nothing. With the help of a surgeon he might yet recover, and prove an ass. How chance Moonshine is gone, before Thisbe comes back and finds her lover. She will find him by starlight. Here she comes, and her passion ends the play. Enter Thisbe. Methinks she should not use a long one for such a pyramus. I hope she will be brief. A moot will turn the balance. Which pyramus, which Thisbe, is the better? She hath spied him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means, Vida Liset. Asleep, my love? Oh, oh, what? Bed, my dove? Oh, Paramus, arise! Speak, speak! Quite dumb! Dead, dead! A tomb must cover thy sweet eyes! These lily lips, this cherry nose, these yellow cowslip cheeks, are gone, are gone. <laughs> Lovers make moan, his eyes were green as lips. Oh, sisters three, come, come to me. With hands as pale as milk, lay them in gold, since you have shorn with shears his thread of silk. Tongue, not a word. Come, trusty sword. Come, blade, my breast in rue. And farewell, friends. Thus this being. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Dies. Moonshine and lion are left to bury the dead. Ay, and wall too. No, I assure you, the wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue? Or to hear a Bergamas dance between two of our company. No epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. Never excuse. For when the players are all dead, there need none to be blamed. Marry, if he that writ it had played Pyramus, and hanged himself in Thisbe's garter, it would have been a fine tragedy. And so it is, truly, and very notably discharged. But come, your Bergamask, let your epilogue alone. Here a dance of clowns. The iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve. Lovers, to bed, tis almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn, As much as we this night have overwatched. This palpable gross play hath well beguiled The heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed. A fortnight hold we this solemnity In nightly revels and new jollity. Exeunt. End of scene one. Act five, scene two. Enter Puck. Now the hungry lion roars, and the wolf behowls the moon, whilst the heavy ploughman snores all with weary task fordone. Now the wasted brands do glow, whilst the scritch owl, scritching loud, puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. Now it is the time of night that the graves, all gaping wide, every one lets forth its sprite in the churchway paths to glide, and we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun, following darkness like a dream, now our frolic, not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door. Enter Oberon and Titania with their train. Through the house give glimmering light by the dead and drowsy fire. Every elf and fairy sprite hop as light as bird for briar. And this ditty, after me, sing and dance it trippingly. 
first rehearse your song by rote, to each word a warbling note. Hand in hand, with fairy grace, will we sing and bless this place. Song and Dance now, until the break of day, through this house each fairy stray, to the best bride-bed will we, which by us shall blessed be. And the issue there create ever shall be fortunate, so shall all the couples three ever true in loving be. And the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand, never mole, hair-lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious such as are despised in nativity shall upon their children be with this field do consecrate every fairy take his gate and each several chamber bless through this palace with sweet peace ere shall it in safety rest and the owner of it blessed trip away make no stay Meet me all by break of day. Exeunt Oberon, Titania, and Train If we shadows have offended, Think but this, and all is mended, That you have but slumbered here While these visions did appear, And this weak and idle theme No more yielding but a dream. Gentles do not reprehend, If you pardon we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck, now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends. Exit. End of Act Five, Scene Two. End of A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare.